Welcome back! Welcome back! I feel like I've finally gotten into my monthly rhythm. Well, at least that's what happened last year. It was going well for four or five months, and then we will call that the end of a season. A gap means that's the end of a season. I would like to do these more often, but I don't have that much unique to say that often. The daily stuff would be Bible study, and you can just get that anywhere. Um, I do have a few topics that I would like to do some standalone shows on, just me talking. Those have been the most popular. Um, oh, uh, but before I forget, I did an interview with Mike Meharry on his podcast shortly after he was a guest here. If you want to Google God Archie Adam Terrell or God Archie Laws of War, it's spelled God, God Archie, God Archie Laws of War, it should come up. It was different than my standalone podcast on the biblical laws for war. I think it's a bit more digestible when someone is asking me questions. That's why I prefer to do guest interviews here. Uh, and I think that some of the laws for war land better and feel a bit more rooted in real life when I'm talking to someone who's never heard them before. Maybe that's just me. I really don't like talking into a vacuum. Speaking of talking into a vacuum, I would really appreciate it if you could drop me an email. I'd like to hear what's resonating with you, what you hate, uh, a disagreement. Just send me something. Theocrat at gmail.com. That's T H E E O crat at gmail.com. Like the end out. The O crat at gmail.com. Theocrat at gmail.com. There's about 200 of you now who listen regularly. Even with how sporadic I've released these, I feel like that's a lot of listeners for how far off the beaten path this podcast is. Okay, intro. Let's get into it. My guest today is Kevin Novak. I first met Kevin at my local assembly in North Texas back when I was living there. I've moved. For some of you who don't know, I'm not going to tell you where yet. Uh, my parents visited with his family at a potluck and found they had some favorite authors in common. I visited with Kevin a few times and been shown hospitality at his house several times. Kevin is in the interesting position of being a prosecuting attorney in Fort Worth, Texas, which is near Dallas, and he has a pretty radical perspective on God's law, comparatively speaking today at least. I think that gives him a unique perspective on what goes on locally, and I think he has some wisdom on what to do about it. He actually has a ministry that has nothing to do with criminal justice on the surface, but everything at the root. Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. See, I have taught you statutes and rules, as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? My name's Adam Terrell, and I'm here to encourage you to obey the law and think about it and speak about it constantly. I broke the law. Christ paid my debt by sacrificing himself so that I can be clean to offer myself as a living sacrifice back to God. The entire Mosaic law is obligatory for everyone. Keeping some of the laws look different today because the light of further revelation supersedes shadows in the old law. The temple sacrifices are an example where we have something better. Note that we must still obey the Mosaic laws for sacrifices. There is still a temple, and priests are still required to offer sacrifices. It's just that the priests, the sacrifices, and the temple are all better now. God will show grace to those who apply the law to themselves, to those who have hidden the law in their hearts, and he will judge those who disobey accordingly. I must apply it to myself, and then those around me will see its fruit and be drawn to its goodness. Theocracy grows by the sword of the Spirit, God's word, and self-sacrifice. The law's purpose is to give a path to restoration. Christ has restored me, so I must seek to restore others by sacrificing myself. Thanks for listening. My goal with each conversation is to edify and bring the law and wisdom to bear on each person's current situation in life. Well, thanks, Adam. I appreciate you having me on. And I just know over the last few years that I've known you and gotten to know you a great deal more, I just appreciate your thoughts and your the way you think as a Christian. So it's always good to chat with you and have you sharpen my sword and challenge me on some things. And hopefully I can do the same for you. 
So my name is Kevin Novak, and I live in Texas, the Great Republic. And just as a sidebar, I'm one of those few people that thinks that the state flag should fly higher than the U.S. flag. But we can have that conversation another time with the Christian flag above that, of course. But anyway, yeah, I live in the Great Republic of Texas, and I've lived here for a couple of years. I'm a prosecutor, so I do practice law. I'm an attorney. And one of the great things about being a prosecutor is that it doesn't on a daily basis, it doesn't necessarily mean that I have to compromise my thoughts as a Christian. Uh, we could, we'll talk more about this later, but I do believe in limited jurisdiction for the civil government. Really what that means, the civil government's jurisdiction is to promote good and punish evildoers. So I punish evildoers for a living. And there are some things, of course, some major things that become more, that can become more Christian in the criminal justice system, but that's going to take time as we take more and more ground back from humanists, from unbelievers. Uh, before living in Texas, I lived in Georgia for a short time, and prior to that, I was in, in Virginia for about seven years. That's where I went to law school, uh, Liberty University, which I think is the best law school in the world. And then prior to that, I grew up and lived in the Chicagoland area for uh, over three decades. I've, I'm married. I've got three wonderful kids, uh, Reagan, Simeon, and Arabella. And the way that I became a Christian, uh, God, of course, imputed that on me. And he, I thank him every day for his grace and making me a believer. But I grew up in a home where I was, for the most part, single mother. And she worked so hard for us. Um, and I think I, because I had some health problems, I think... As a younger person, I, I, when I say younger, I mean like, you know, three, four, five, six, seven years old, I was someone that thought about life and death. And I think I'm just a contemplative person to begin with. I think deeply, I, I don't do well with superficiality. I kind of wish I did because that would make life a little easier, <laughs> but I, it, I think it does. Yeah. So I, I've always, I think since I was young, as long as I can remember, I've always believed that there's a God. I just... I just couldn't believe that there wasn't a God. I've always believed there's a God. But growing up, I think I was like any other younger person. I attached myself to things that, like everybody else did, sports. Uh, you know, I drank off and on. Not, not a lot. It was just a regular college thing where you party and, and think what you're doing is fun and enjoyable. So I, I had the regular experiences but those things weren't satisfying to me at all. Even when I was doing them, I knew they weren't satisfying to me, but I really didn't know what Christianity was all about. And I didn't move in that direction. And quite honestly, I'm not blaming anyone else for this, but I really didn't have someone there to show me what Christianity was all about, at least not with true freedom, liberty, deep thinking, because now, and again, we can talk about this later, to a greater degree, of course, and I love this, but with Reformed theology and how deeply it looks at God as best as we can from a human perspective, that is so satisfying to me. And if I think, I'd like to think that if I had that exposed to me as a younger person, I might have become a Christian earlier. But nevertheless, it's God's timing. And when I was in high school, uh, my senior year, I played in a basketball ministry as a player, of course, and I enjoyed it. It was with some of my friends, and it was an outreach ministry through Medina Baptist Church. So essentially, we would we would just play games against other teams, and we'd have a practice once a week, and in that practice would be a short uh, Christian devotional. And it it was fine, you know. I put I put up with it. I it didn't really take effect or anything, but. About five, six years later, when I was done with college and I was in the working world, I had gotten laid off from one of my jobs. They were downsizing. It was a tech company, and they downsized. So I was laid off, and I just remember thinking, I need to, I need to stay busy. I need to find more things to do. I went out and got a part-time job. I was looking for a full-time job. But one of the things I did was I called my former coach, Wayne, and I said, Wayne, I, I, you know, I know I haven't talked to you in a number of years, but I'd like to come out and coach basketball and in your ministry. And he said, yeah, come on out. You know, it was 
pretty, very simple conversation. He said, come on out on Monday and we'll get together and we'll talk about it. So that's what I did. I went out and talked with Wayne and he connected me with another guy, Bob, who became a mentor to me. And we coached basketball in this basketball ministry together for, I don't know, five, six, seven years. And it was great. That's, be, that's how I became a Christian. I was just around some cr fine Christian men. And it's funny because I was actually volunteering, serving in a basketball ministry before I even became a Christian. You know, it's usually you become a Christian and then you start serving in different capacities. But I was serving in this basketball ministry and the guys kept inviting me out to service. And I put it off for a good while. It was probably, you know, a good eight, nine months. I put it off. Finally, I'm like, all right, I'll go to church. And it's a couple of years later, that's how I met my wife was in this same church. And she had come back from New Jersey where she was working after 9-11 and it's 2001. And, um, and she and I were volunteering in, the, in a homeless outreach ministry. And so, I, you know, it's through this church that I became a Christian and ultimately led, uh, met my wife. So the two greatest gifts I've been given so far, just my salvation, then, of course, meeting my wife, which is, which is uh, such a blessing to me. So. so how did you go from there to getting into legal because it was basketball ministry and you were already out of college where did that come from yeah so my wife and i we were we had moved she she had uh bought a place up in the northwest suburbs of chicago and that's where she was working and i ultimately was working up there too and after we got married we were living in the northwest suburbs and because we were so far away from our church, the church that she grew up in, and then the church that I was attending as a Christian, we were too far away from it. So we were going to a church called The Orchards in Arlington Heights, Illinois, and we were, we were going there. And I started the basketball ministry there at that church. So we were in the same basketball league, but it was just a different church that I was coaching. And at the same time, I began to think more contemplatively about my career and where I was going. And I, I just think that I wanted to be utilized more. I think, you know, I was in insurance and that's a fine industry to be in. It's, it's I think one of those industries that still somewhat resembles biblical law or biblical concepts because it's people voluntarily sharing their things and sharing risk. But I just, I wanted to do more. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a smart person, I like to think, and my wife is the same way. And I just thought, you know, law school, is something I really want to think about. And I had a friend that was a lawyer at the time. So I thought, you know, I think I'm in that category of people that I could do this. And so I, I got ready and applied. And anyway, I, I mentioned that basketball ministry because I had been accepted to attend Liberty University School of Law. They had invited me to attend, but I still wasn't sure if I was going to go. Well, one night I was at the gym with the guys and still working in the basketball ministry and I we were a player short so I thought you know I I think I'll jump in here and you know I'll, I'll be the 10th guy and we can play five on five and and as a sidebar I'll say I wasn't sure yet if I was going to move my wife and I to Virginia to go to law school or if I was going to stay in Illinois and just continue this basketball ministry and continue my insurance path so it was it was one of two things really and when I was playing that night, I, I just hurt my ankle really badly. It was, it was just a, a bone chip fracture, but I hurt my ankle very badly. And I remember sitting in the living room that night after I got back from the hospital, having x-rays done, and I remember telling my wife, I said, you know, seems to me like God is leading me a certain direction. Like basketball is not really the the area that I need to focus on. So I only do that for so long. Yeah. And I, I said to myself, you know, well, it sounds like we're moving to Virginia. So that's what we did. And, and, uh, you know, it was great. My wife and I, we quit our jobs, which was a, you know, big deal, even in 2009, where this is right around the time that the market got real bad. And we moved to Virginia and I took, we, you know, my wife fortunately was able to get a good job with a company there and they're actually headquartered here in Texas, but um, it worked out really well. Everything, all the pieces of the puzzle just kept falling into place and not in the way I would have thought, but 
And so that's how I ended up in law school. This is basically wanted to utilize myself to a greater degree, which is what I've been doing, I think. So was there something getting into legal that got you turned on to some different ministries or how you started to approach law biblically? How long had you been a believer at, at this point when you, when you actually started practicing law? So let's see, it probably would have been, I was probably a believer for about eight, eight or nine years, maybe, maybe, man, eh, maybe nine or nine or 10 years. So it's interesting when I look back on it, you know, becoming a Christian, I think was a slow process for me. I know becoming regenerated is a one-time thing. And I, and I, I don't really think it is necessary to debate like how long it takes to actually become a Christian. But for me, it was, a, I think a slower process but then I also think, you know, I, I, I was, when I went to law school, I was in the camp of believers who I didn't necessarily have a set theology. I wouldn't say, because mo most people who become Christians are not necessarily automatically in the reforms category because it takes time. I don't mean this to sound condescending to people who aren't reformed, but it just takes time to develop the way you think as a Christian. And I think the Reformed theology with it focusing more and more on the Old Testament, or at least not automatically rejecting Old Testament provisions of law, I think that it takes time to get to that point. So I think by default, people are somewhat in more of a, like a premillennial or dispensational category. And I, again, I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying that's kind of where I was. I was just a believer and I wanted to do more. And I saw that there were all these cultural issues happening and I wanted to be effective. So I would not have been able to necessarily articulate where I was theology wise at that point when I first started law school. But when I was in law school, I had a number of professors that were not only, well, they were not only reformed, but they were theonomic. And they didn't necessarily, that, that topic didn't necessarily come up in class, it, it might have come up here and there, but it wasn't like that was on my radar. It wasn't like even Reformed theology was on my radar. It's just over time, I be as a believer, I could no longer take the position that I want to help society as a lawyer and not have something, not have biblical concepts in my backpack or in my luggage that I'm carrying with me in order to implement, if that makes sense. Because, you know, I don't know if you've talked to other guests about this, but, you know, there's always that issue with now Christians being somewhat antinomian, antinomian, or at least, you know, we've talked before about how you can't beat something with nothing. And so I began to realize as a believer in law school, well, when I go out and I start practicing and I start articulating Christian law and what it should be propositionally, this is how society ought to be. And this, these are the principles we ought to implement. I didn't necessarily have anything to hang my hat on. So that's what got me, I think, more into reform theology over time. But really what made me conscious of reform theology was in my last year of law school, I stumbled upon, I guess providentially, it's always providential, but I stumbled upon Greg Bonson. And Greg Bonson if this were even possible, because, you know, law school for me was like throwing gasoline on a fire. And then Greg Bonson was even more so that it was like I just stumbled on these audio uh, discs of Greg Bonson. And that was like someone throwing even more gasoline on the fire. And it was like, holy cow, this guy is just such a great thinker. And I just can't believe it. It was just I couldn't get enough of Greg Bonson. I would listen to him. And so one thing led to another. And I kind of went from where I was as a Christian lawyer or someone studying to be a Christian lawyer right into pretty much adopting the theonomy um, and, and really wanting to know, know more about it. But even more so than that, it was Greg Bonson deals a lot. He, uh, of course, dealt a lot with apologetics, but the procedure in the, the arguments for even defending Christianity procedurally were what uh, really got me to theonomy and then wanting to do more biblically for Christianity as a lawyer anyway. You mentioned earlier, uh, you don't have to compromise 
in what you do in terms of punishing criminals. Can you flesh that out a little bit for me? Yeah, I mean, to, to some degree, I do have to compromise, but in, in addressing what I said earlier about how I don't necessarily have to compromise my beliefs to do what I do. And really what I mean by that is the work that I do on education speaks to this. And that is you've got family government, church government, and civil government. And civil government is limited biblically in, in the civil government, mainly through Romans 13, but there are also so many other provisions, so many other biblical scriptures, uh, verses that speak to this, but civil government is limited to promoting good, not providing good, but promoting good and punishing evildoers. And so when I'm at work every day, you know, we still have, for the most part, we still have a set of crimes that resemble Christianity. You know, you've got criminal trespass, you've got theft, you've got murder, you've got uh, you know, so many, uh, assault well, and battery. People, yeah. Assault and battery, all these things that, uh, are reflective of, of protecting the image bearer man made in God's image. And then also, um, property life, life and property and wealth and so on. You know, like I was actually as a sidebar, but I was talking to someone the other day about, uh, animal cruelty, you know, and, and I, and we can talk about that some other time, but you know, there are things like that and even drugs. Like I, I would consider myself a Romans 13 libertarian. That's what I call myself. I'm a libertarian, but Romans 13 is, is, is allowing me to punish evildoers. So, you know, a lot of the cases I handle, most of them, thankfully are still dealing with protecting life and protecting property. And those, of course, are two big things when it comes to the Bible. So I think in that regard, it do, what I do allows me to think like a Christian. And there are some other things, too, like uh, finding people, which is a big deal for me, not because it, you know, theoretically people complain it raises revenue for the state. But the thing I, I see with that is it's quasi um, slavery, like in other words, with economics being a big deal in the Bible, Gary North and Gary DeMar have talked about this with through American Vision over the years so much. You know, the Bible is big on economics. And, and if people can pay financially for their crimes, not pay off the crime or the punisher, but, but suffer economically, I find that oftentimes they learn more quickly. But, you know, on the flip side of that, the mechanisms I have for punishing people are not ones that I necessarily like. I should say restitution is a big deal too. Gary North hammers on that so much. And, and I think that's good because, you know, in the Bible, it, it, there's made a big deal about restitution and how much to pay. And, you know, granted the, mechan the mechanism now or the quantity that we have people pay back is not necessarily two for one or three for one, but nevertheless, it's, it, I can still do things with restitution. But the thing I don't like about what I do is with probation. And there's so much about probation I don't like. For example, probation oftentimes is, is getting into a rehabilitative perspective on, on dealing with the evildoer. So, I, I, you know, with Romans 13, we're supposed to punish, but also... When we wield the sword, it's not in vain. It's supposed to deter people. So other people are supposed to come along and say, oh, wait a minute, that guy got punished pretty badly for what he did. I ought not do that. So that's obviously what I do has a deterrence factor to it. But the problem with that continuum with punishment, deterrence, and rehabilitative is, you know, deterrence can bleed over into this rehabilitative nature. And I, that's the problem I see with probation. Probation, I think, is basically like, in so many instances, it's a glorified dad where you, so many people involved in the criminal justice system are there because they didn't have a dad or they didn't have someone teaching them or discipling them they with the way they should have. And this, again, is, is invoking what I do through the ministry, Deconstructing the Coliseum, is dealing with education and discipleship. You know, I, one time I did a devotional. It's kind of tongue in cheek, of course, but I did a devotional that I think young men should join gangs. And the reason why is because as a society, if we're going to say that, okay, it's okay to have two mothers and not one mother and one father, 
wh where are they going to get their male discipleship from? So why, why you can't have it both ways. You can't say, you know, you're not allowed to join a gang, but you, you're, we're going to make you have two mothers. So why not 10 dads? Why not 10 dads? Why not 10 mothers, you know? And so why can't your parent be another, uh, an 18 year old when you're a 17 year old, you know, you, you get all these arbitrary categories. And so, but anyway, yeah, that's a big, you know, the, the thing is, I don't have a lot of options with probation. I really don't like probation. I understand like in a modern society, you know, we're not at the point yet we're going to be reinstituting uh, biblical servitude, which by the way, a lot of people forget this in, in, in uh, the 13th Amendment, um, you know, we have the ability to, um, to utilize uh, involuntary servitude and it's, it's relating to crimes. And so I think we, we forget that a lot, but, you know, we're not at that point yet where we're dealing with someone in that respect. But, but I hope that um, the 13th Amendment says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist. So we can still utilize that. But, you know, we're, it's going to take us time to move in that direction. I think it's too recent in our history for us to to even start thinking about and we prefer it behind closed doors because people in prison they still work they get paid like two three cents a day for work in a lot of prisons and then they're able to use those pennies to buy candy bars and things like that so it's a way to sort of keep them productive and sane in prison mm -hmm. well one other thing i want to mention is i, I re discovered this provision maybe a few months ago and i'm looking just for an opportunity to implement it but the uh, Texas legislature, the Texas code, the statutes allows for someone that is a, let's see, a defendant, someone who either pleads guilty or is, is convicted. The legislature allows for the victim to choose a, an organization for the defendant to perform community service at, if that makes sense. So as part of a plea, plea agreement, the victim might say, you know what, I want the defendant to do 12 hours community service at this food bank. And, and if the defendant agrees to that, to do community service, they could do 12 hours at this food bank, which is the victim's choosing. And that's, I think, a way to at least reflect some kind of biblical law while not necessarily needing it to be codified the way I want it to be codified. Yeah, it's sort of like we're, and, and I think part of that is healthy. When you mess up as badly as the United States did with slavery, you want to put some, some barriers between that and uh, the way that we currently do things now. So even, I mean, the idea is good. It's in, It's enshrined in our in our law, even the, the United States constitution. And it's just, it's still, I think for so many people, just because they haven't ever had that conversation mm -hmm. and there's just such a spirit of antinomianism in Christianity that, well, we assume that the law doesn't apply and we need a special reason to assume that it does rather than it be the opposite way around. Mm -hmm. Well, and I also think that people are not necessarily thinking as precisely as we want them to. And I, I know that it took time for me to get there too, where I needed one of the, the, I'll tell you, I didn't mention this earlier, but one of the reasons I really wanted to go to law school was so that I could think more clearly and more precisely. And so slavery, the word slavery obviously has this negative connotation and that's okay. It should, you know, it's bad theology. Slavery is, is wrong theology where, where you ha you have to first start with the premise that there are multiple races, which was a function of mainly Darwinism and, and bad theology. That's not a function of Christianity or some kind of white privilege or European, uh, the rule of law or the Western legal tradition. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with bad theology and wrong theology and sinful theology and asserting that there are multiple races and one having the God-given right to assert them serve a certain race or group of people over another well and it was straight up kidnapping yeah that too which is which is a capital offense in old testament law 
Yeah, so I think I think you know the conversations that we're having now I don't think are necessarily productive because we're not starting with the right premises. You know, um, I think that the, you, and, and I get this through my work where you know they're not even necessarily allowing people to start from the perspective that there aren't multiple races. And I know Christians, and a lot of this has to do with how you define a race. So I get that. And I, I know that there are different arguments when it comes to the sons of Noah and then dividing them and looking at all that. And there's some good study being done on, on that. Uh, I was, I've been watching some videos lately uh, from Answers in Genesis about this and studying the Y chromosome and the history or the, the uh, uh, or different arguments and relating to, you know, different races and classes. I, I think it's better to talk in terms of ethnicities and cultures than it is races, you know, because when we get into this idea of races, it gets into there being not only what I think are, are multiple uh, macro evolutions, but m multiple creations. And it's just, it doesn't reflect, I think, biblical theology where there are two initial people that everyone developed from. Uh, but anyway, you know, in terms of like the 13th Amendment and where we are now, I mean, I, I do think that we need to move on to better conversations and, and, and that can speak to a greater degree and a more productive degree and what we ought to do with criminals and having the, the justice system actually be productive for society and there being work involved and servitude involved and covenants involved rather than just putting people in these big buildings where they're not, they're really not doing anything. Where they can't hurt anybody else. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I understand the concept because when I go to the office every day, I walk right by the jail and I, you know, I'm not going to lie to you. I feel safer that there is a jail, but, but I think at some point we're going to need, and I know many people, including American Vision, over the years and many other good organizations and people have really tried to get us on this track of, hey, let's have a productive conversation about what to do with criminals. But, uh, you know, what I do now and in terms of the ministry with, with education, I think it, it's helpful that I'm involved with criminal law because when I can talk to someone about criminal law, it, it obviously has to do with jurisdiction. And then I can talk to someone about education and discipleship and not only not only have greater conversations about what we were talking about just a few moments ago. And that is so many people are involved with the criminal justice system because they didn't have fathers. And also this idea of jurisdiction where you have limited jurisdiction for the civil government. And guess what that doesn't include? It doesn't include the right to use force and coercion to advance thoughts on people, especially, you know, five year olds. So what do you deal with day to day? I know a lot of people are really focused on national politics or international politics. What actually goes on locally? What do you see that most people wouldn't necessarily be aware of? Because it feels a lot of times like nobody's really minding the store mm -hmm. at, in, you know, in my city, local city council, city government. Yeah, that's good. You know, and, and by asking that question, I think you're, you're in, impliedly making a good point, And that is we do tend to pay attention to what the president is doing every day. Really what ought to be happening is we ought to be paying attention to the local water board, these local municipalities and independent districts that it can actually tax us like school districts and water districts, depending on what state you're in, because you know, every that states have different mechanisms for this. Illinois actually has the highest number by far. I used to live in Illinois. Illinois is by the, by far the highest number of taxing districts. I mean, in Illinois, I used to live in a city, a township, a county, and then obviously a state. And then the state is involved with regional, uh, regional, sometimes state can be involved with regional boards like education boards. And then obviously you've got national politicking that goes on. So you've got all these different people trying to impute things on you. But anyway, on a day-to-day -day basis, I have, I have not paid attention to national things for the most part since like mid-January. And if you think about it, that's for the obvious reasons, because that's when we had the transition of power to Joe Biden. And, and there were still some things happening with the national election. But 
I decided to pay less attention to certain websites and really just being reactive, I decided I'm going to take a break from that. And there really, before I go to sleep at night, there really isn't much value in looking at a website and seeing what so-and-so said or what so-and-so wants to propose. It's just talk. I don't need that. I don't, it doesn't add any value to my life. And a lot of it is just clickbait. Even the, I'm not going to name the websites because I'm not picking it. I don't want to pick on anybody, but but because uh, you know, those websites provide a valuable service to some degree and they let us know what to pay attention to. But I said, you know, I'm just going to pay attention to my job and what I'm supposed to do and try to get better at it. And by nature of that, I also am paying more attention to local activity and state activity. So I will admit, you know, my bandwidth for some of that is pretty low, but in paying attention to the new mayorship, there, there's going to be an election for a new mayor this year. So paying attention to that. Um, in a couple, two, three years, there'll be another election for a new district attorney in Tarrant County, paying attention to that. In paying attention to uh, what's happening with the Republic of Texas via I immigration issues, of course. So in paying attention to those things, and also because I'm fairly new to this area, I've been in Tarrant County, Fort Worth area for about a year, a little over a year, and trying to get back again to building relationships or interacting mainly with Liberty people or like-minded Christians. I'll be attending in a couple of months the National Religious Broadcasters Convention, which will be here in Grapevine, Texas, which is part of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. So I'll get back to, they'll mainly be meeting with like national leaders, but the point is it's for the purpose of bringing awareness to biblical education and abolishing the public school system. But yeah, in paying attention more to local civil government and politics, and also to just day-to-day -day happenings within our area, because in dealing with crime, I can see, you know, being someone I like to think is a fairly right-minded Christian, I can make the connection more easily between what we're not doing covenantally in, in the, the way we're being punished through Deuteronomy 18 or Deuteronomy 28 and with blessings and curses, Deuteronomy 28, 29, I think it is, where like, hey, we're not doing these things biblically and here's how we're being punished mm -hmm. covenantally. Uh, and I know that can sound somewhat abstract, but I, I do walk around on a day-to-day -day basis thinking those things. You know, like, hey, we're, 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 this is where we're making an error. And guess what? Guess what's coming around the corner are these curses. Right. It's like, don't offer your children to Molech versus the land will vomit you out. Hmm. Abortion and high rent prices trying to kick you out of your home <laughs> or property taxes. That's right. And, you know, and, and that isn't all to be doom and gloom. Really, I can see some things happening positively, too. So it's not only making the connection between uh, being a covenant breaker and being cursed. It's also getting back to covenantalism and then being blessed. So, like, obviously, the you know, with COVID, so many unpleasant things happen unnecessarily, by the way, because the civil government, were, were, they were the ones that imposed that on us, mainly high unemployment. And, you know, as any proper thinking Christian knows, taking employment away from someone can take away, especially a man's dignity, because, you know, we are, know early on, like, hey, you're supposed to work. Adam was supposed to work. And with the dominion mandates, that's a that's a big deal, you know. But anyway, with, with one of the things I saw here was they had uh, in the ballot, on the ballot in November, they had a... Uh, and I don't remember the specifics of it, but it related to taxation for the independent school district here in our area. And it was on the ballot, and obviously I voted against it, but it passed 52 to 48. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, that I hate losing. It bothers me that we lost, but that's not bad. I mean, if we're dealing with just another three percentage points to get it, to get something like that blocked, that's making progress, I think. And, and with so many young people and parents getting their children out of this civil government school system, even if it's not for the right reasons, that's still helping. And then little by little, you've got to certain degrees. You've got people, you've got di people in different areas of life. You know, there's a continuum. Some people have had their children at home 
just because maybe they were laid off and, and their children are still going to uh, online public school. But you know what? Hey, I'll take it. But, but then because they're at home, they begin to put the pieces of the puzzle together and they think, wait a minute, why should I be paying for these for this additional tax when I when I just got through teaching my own child at home? So I'm, I'm not going to say that the person is thinking very really clearly as an as an unbeliever, but nevertheless, that's a step in the right direction, where they're beginning to put the pieces of the puzzle of the puzzle together, and that is getting us to do in reverse what happened to us in the 1800s, where people were were veering into this compulsory education model and compulsory attendance model in, in this public consolidation or centralization of American education. So little by little, we're undoing what was done to us, you know, 100, 150 years ago. So in that regard, I do see a return, hopefully, to blessings. And little by little, we're, I think we are getting there. Yeah, I've thought about that, too. Uh, I've mentioned before on the show that I, I grew up completely homeschooled, and that's one of the biggest things. It's like when I learned about property taxes. Wait, what, what do the property taxes go to pay for? Oh, for school. But we've never used those. Right. And I think part of that is the, that's sort of what repent, that's, that's the idea of repentance is sort of a double penalty. You don't just say, oh, the public school shouldn't exist and I'm not going to pay taxes. It's no, I'm being taxed for something that my parents did wrong or my grandparents didn't wrong. But if you want to turn, I think that's sort of, that's God's barrier to entry to see who do you actually believe what I said is true? Because it's going to hurt, but it's the solution. It's just like surgery. You know, I, I got, I'm not going to lie to you. I really wanted to talk over you when you were saying that because it's such an exciting point that you make. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I just really want to jump in there. But I, I, I have a bad habit of doing that. But you are so spot on because it's like, and you know, I, in, in a, I don't want to sound sadistic here, but in a way, you know, I can appreciate that. And I guess it's the way that God deals with us. You know, like you were saying, it's really going to, it's really going to weed out those people that really want it. You know, if you really want something in life, you're going to pay the price for it. And I think, you know, the, the remnant that we have, I'm not just going to say people at homeschool are the remnant, but you know, I do think there's a great overlap there where, you know, if you're, if you are at the point where you're, and it, it takes time, like I mentioned earlier, not everyone become not every parent becomes a Christian overnight and then suddenly, you know, yanks their child out of the civil government school system. That's what people like me and people like you are there for to, to spread the word and to help them think about these things. And, and likewise, they get us to think about some things. But like you were saying, you know, it is that barrier to entry. And it's like, hey, how bad do you want it? You know, and and uh, it's interesting. I just shared a video. It's a, it's a quote unquote secular humanistic video with my nephew this morning, who who is about to graduate from college. And I and I'm I don't I don't I'm not going to say he's a Christian, but he does listen to me. And I shared this video with him. And in the video, it's one of those motivational videos where it says, "Don't ever let anybody tell you that you can't do something." And I looked at that video even as a Christian. I looked at that video, and I think. I'm not going to let anybody tell me what I what I can't do. If it's biblical, I'm going to pray to God that he can make it work for me, and I'm going to go for it. But but in terms of going for it, it hurts because, you know, I've got to pay. It hurts economically. I've got to pay for this classical conversations, which I'm happy to do, extra, like you were saying. You know, I've got to pay for that, and I've got to pay, you know, this huge tax bill at the end of December, all at once, and it's like to you know, I, I'd like a tear rolls down my cheek while I'm writing out this check and thinking like <laughs> what I could be doing with it and the people I could be feeding with it. But uh, but I think that's I think that's right. You know, God does do that to us, and I think that makes it all the more sweeter when we do come back to Him and we repent and we get right back to where we we need to. Well, that's God's whole design, and you know, you can say that something's worth it to you all day long, but if you won't reach into your wallet and hand over your resources, then it doesn't mean anything to you. Um, it's like just in the Garden of Eden, you know, I imagine Adam not knowing how plants work at the very beginning. And Adam comes to God and he says, God, I really like this tree, but I wish it wasn't so far away. I'd love to have that tree over here. Is there, how do, how do I make another tree? And so God tells Adam, go pick some of the fruit from that tree. And Adam picks it and he eats it. He's like, yeah, I know it's really good food. 
And God says, no, I want you to pick some off that tree and I want you to bury it in the ground. You don't get to eat it. And Adam goes, no, no, no. I said, I want more fruit. And God's like, would you just, would you just do what I tell you to do? Would you just give up what you want? And then you'll get it returned to you in more, more than you gave up way more. If you'll just wait and be patient and take the hit short term and you'll get more in the long term. Yeah, that's, that's great. The way you've explained that. And I, you know, it's delayed gratification, which we're not as good at as we used to be, you know, here in this nation, I think, you know, the people that came before us even a long time ago, I think they knew about delayed gratification and, you know, they, when they first came here, they were all about survival, which, you know, in and of itself is, is when you have to work, it causes you to have to work for something and wait because you really don't have a choice, but you know, I, I do want to make a point, though, about like, you know, you had mentioned earlier about, you know, we're trying to basically correct. And, and you, you did say it in a way that was like vindictive or critical of like our ancestors or our parents or whatever. But you talked about like us having to correct things that people did before us or implemented before us. And, you know, th I agree with you. And, and what I'm thankful for is, you know, we've got, so my mother is in Chicago area. So unfortunately she's not necessarily here physically, but my in-laws are here near us. And even though my wife and her siblings went to a public school, my in-laws are very supportive of us homeschooling and, and they go so far as to come over and watch our a couple of our kids while my wife takes my daughter to classical conversations because my two youngest, the twins, are not old enough yet. They're going to go in the fall. They'll start in the fall, but they're not old enough yet to go to classical conversations. And so my point is that that's a way for that older generation to help make what's right and, and help us steer in the right direction because, you know, grandparents, if, if they're physically able to, they're a huge part in homeschooling and discipling and not only making, not only helping us steer in the right direction and in kind of redoing, you know, maybe what they did. And again, I don't mean that be critical. It's just that that was kind of what they grew up in and, and they, maybe they didn't know any better. Or they didn't have anyone teaching them. And to be fair, you know, I'll never believe in civil government schools, even if they are quote unquote Christian, they're still unbiblical because they exist. But at the time that, that I was going to public school, it was still, you know, they weren't as bad, I guess. I, I hate to say that because God would cringe, you know, and, and saying, oh, it's, they weren't as bad, but, but, um, well, my dad grew up in a, in a public school and they would, he, he was born in 55. I think that was actually the year they took prayer out of schools, but he grew up, you know, in Longview, Texas, that's the Bible belt. They still said prayers over the loudspeaker every day. And, um, my dad wouldn't say it was so much the, of the bad stuff that he learned. It was the good stuff that he didn't learn in school that he wish he had. Okay, that's a good point. So I understand exactly what you're saying. Less bad, obviously, having prayer in school is good, but that still doesn't excuse the method. Right, and now they're not the civil government school system. They're overtly anti-Christian, and they're bad. <laughs> and they're bad. So, it, you know, they're bad in, in a sense that, like, there's so much you know, sin that goes on there where it's drugs and premarital sex and, and coveting and, and all that. But, but it's also bad theology and it's also the wrong propositions that are taught to young people. But it's making parents feel like disobeying God is the easier path because scripture says, train your children and the parents say, Oh, I'm going to give them to somebody else. Well, and you know, I think that's where people have a hard time with, with me when I say, you know what, if you took your children out of the civil government school system and you just had them home all day, kind of just lounging around, they would be better off. People have trouble with that. That's the conclusion my dad came to teaching in a private Christian school. He could have sent us there for free because he was a teacher there and he decided not to because he said, I've seen what goes on in the private Christian schools. I'm not putting my kids into that. Yeah, that's saying something. That's too bad. That's too bad. But um, yeah, I guess, you know, there's an opportunity cost. You know, there's a flip side to it. And, and when you're, 
when you, the, the fact of the matter is, you know, like you were saying, when we do things God's way, you know, it's not always easy at first, but I know I look back and I'm totally cliche when I say this, but I do look back and I, I think, you know, the, th the bad things that happened to me, relatively speaking, there were some bad things that happened to me, but there were some mild bad things that happened to me too. And I look back at all those things and I think, you know, for my better, just for my better. And they were a blessing because they caused me to go in a certain direction. They caused me to learn things. I still have many lessons to learn and they'll hurt, but I, I got to tell you, I'm so thankful that, that I, and I, I know this is going to sound bad. I'm not trying to be critical of parents who put their children in a civil government school, but I am so thankful that I will at least be able to grow up and grow old and know that I, I exercise my biblical duty to raise my children in the Lord's admonition. So the thing is, a lot of people, they'll say, well, just because you homeschool your kids doesn't mean that they're going to become Christians, but they're missing the point. There, there's no biblical duty for a parent to make their child a Christian. I can't even make my child a Christian. The Bible makes that very clear that only God can save. You know, it's in Jonah. That's mainly where I reference it. Salvation comes from the Lord. And in John 1, verses 12 and 13, salvation comes from God. So I, even if there, well, there would, there would never be a biblical interpretation of any part of scripture that would conclude that Kevin, as a dad, must make his child a Christian. The, the biblical duty owed to God is to raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And it's between the parent, or pardon me, it's between the child and God to determine what happens. And in, in I don't believe that someone can quote unquote accept Christ because I think God causes that to happen to you. But in an operational sense, it's really between the child and God. It's between those two parties, and those two covenant with one another. So it, the, the point is, you know, it's not about making your child a Christian. It's about teaching them Christianity. And of course, I'm going to, you know, present the gospel to my children. But I can't make them accept. I can't make them become Christians. God's the one who grants them the faith. It's you give them the opportunity. And like you were saying earlier, just with connection to the justice system, fatherlessness is so often the cause of that. And I think that's by God's design. And people, children are supposed to have a father because we're supposed to be a representative of a heavenly father. And if they don't have that on earth to look at, you know, Jesus would say oftentimes, if you don't believe me when I talk to you about earthly things, how are you going to understand when I talk to you about heavenly things? You've got to understand the earthly first and then to make the connection to the heavenly. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think about what happens with pro people on probation. They... I bet you I could stand out the probation office, you know, for a week and everybody that walks in there, just ask them one question. Where was your dad when you were growing up? And I bet you the vast majority of, majority of them would say, well, he wasn't there or he was there and he was out, you know, with his girlfriend or he was there, but he was in the back doing smoking this or snorting that. And, and there's a direct correlation between that, you know, and I, I'm not suggesting that, the, that it's a dad's job to like beat or even punish the child. But the Bible does talk over and over again about sparing the rod. And th there does come a point if it's necessary for the father to deal physically with the child. It's supposed to be that boundary of, of both, just like Deuteronomy 28, like you were saying, you got blessings for obedience, you got curses for, for disobedience. And it, that's supposed to be a direction. I was having a conversation the other day on Facebook with somebody about this. A rebuke is edification. A rebuke has to be for the purpose of building up. Because if somebody starts going the wrong way, if they enter a street that has a sign that says, do not enter, that do not enter, that's a rebuke. Mm -hmm. So that you won't crash. Yeah, and I think a lot of I think a lot of times about lifting weights. When you're lifting weights, your muscle is literally tearing. And in, in, I guess technically you're getting weaker, but you wait a few days. That's why you're not supposed to work the same muscle groups consecutive days because you need to give your time, your body some time to grow, 
to grow back, but you're going to grow stronger. Mm. And it hurts, you know, I mean, it's only lifting weights. It's an analogy, but it does hurt and it's uncomfortable and it's painful. Spankings hurt too. <laughs> and that's, it's supposed to be a signal. One thing I wanted to mention earlier where you said it's a, it's a, I don't want to be critical of the people that came before me. My parents gave me far above and beyond everything that, that they had received. And that's the goal is to be improving, to always be reforming. But there are still some areas where I feel, where now that I'm an adult, I know I had some weaknesses in. And our attitude shouldn't be, that's the beautiful thing about forgiveness, is it really doesn't care who whose fault it was. It takes responsibility. I'm going to take responsibility and it's going to cost me time, it's going to cost me effort, it's going to cost me money. Because I'm not concerned that the other person pay for what they did. I don't, I don't care. Even if they're not going to, it doesn't matter. I'm going to fix this problem and I'm gonna, it's going to stop now. Jesus said the same thing about, um, same thing to the Pharisees. He said, you, you know, your father stoned the prophets. And the Pharisees, their attitude was, well, we're not like our fathers. We wouldn't have done that. So you can't, you can't bring that down on us. And Jesus said, basically, it's implied because you answered that way, you would. And you, you are going to kill the prophet. And so it's that change of attitude that God's looking for. Oh, if you wouldn't have done that, well, then you need to repent for, for what your parents did. Not saying it's your fault, saying it's your responsibility to make it right. Because if you don't do it, then, then who is? Well, I, I tell you, when I'm able to do that successfully, and I'm not going to say that that's all the time, but when I am able to do that successfully, I feel like a solid Christian. I feel like a man. <laughs> I feel like a good husband. And I feel like I feel like a successful attorney because, you know, th this doesn't capture all of it. But when you take the high road, like Jesus did so many times, and you do suck it up and get the job done, then that's really where we need to be. And, you know, there, that would I guess that spawns a whole other conversation about like masculinity in our time. And and that makes me also think about the pulpit and, and different things. But it, I just, I feel like a man when I do that. You know, one of the great things about having children, I think for me, I'm the youngest of four. So I think all, I grew, and again, I'm not blaming anyone, I'm just analyzing it. And that is when I was growing up, it was kind of like, Kevin, I was always on the, I was always behind the curve on what people were talking about, if that makes sense, as the youngest. Because, you know, the conversation tends to be a function of the most experienced people instead of, all of you together. What, um, this is a tangent. I hope I can remember what I'm talking about here. But homeschoolers, what I like about homeschoolers is no matter their age, they tend to talk with one another about common experiences. So it's not like the youngest person is left out. So I know that like when I'm standing with a family, that I, maybe I just been at church and I'm talking to the parents and the children are standing right there. I try to talk with all of them instead of just talking about the adults or talking to the adults about their experiences. I might ask the young people, you know, sometimes jokingly, I'll ask like a six year old, like, what do you do for a living? You know, what kind of work do you do? <laughs> Is it fun? You know, like they're supposed to think about work as a man, but I guess where I was going with that is what I like about being a father is it's, it makes me feel masculine. It makes me feel like I'm taking dominion. It makes me feel it makes me feel Christian. And, and I love that, you know, and that has to, that make that's in the category of education and discipleship and leading. And those, I think those ideas, they're making a comeback, but I think they're, they're almost, if they're not at a low point, they're pretty doggone close right now in Christian circles. I think they are making a comeback. And as you know, like I'm optimistic, I, you know, I'm, I might sound pessimistic and then, the current state of things, but I'm op optimistic in where we're going because I don't, I, I tend to be, po think post millennial or all millennial and that I don't think things are getting worse. I think they're getting better, but I do think like, you know, education is the silver bullets of bringing our na nation back to godly principles. And, but, but yeah, I, I guess where I was, I went, you know, I went off on a, a couple of tangents there, but I guess where I was going with that is, you know, I just feel, 
I feel like a man. I feel powerful. I feel like I've got authority when I when I'm dealing with children and especially my own. And I'm like, hey, I'm leading them. But if you're sending them off to this building every day where you're not the one discipling them, I just I struggle to think about how you really could feel that way as a as a father. Well, and it's it's not so much that you're farming that out because there are some, I, I think there probably are some some parents that realize that hey, I'm not gonna I don't know anything about what I'm teaching them. I need to give my children over to somebody that does know more. Uh, but then the problem with public education is that you don't know who's teaching them. When's the last time you had a, a conversation? Are you having a conversation every week with your school teacher? Because the day-to-day -day stuff is where things are happening. You have a parent-teacher conference once every, I don't even know how often, six months, a couple times a year. What about the What about the daily stuff? And then the other thing that you were mentioning too about feeling like a man well, and that's, that's what being a Christian is all about. How can we be like Christ? Christ is the poster child for taking responsibility for things that he didn't do. And that's what, and he doesn't think of that as a burden. Obviously it was a burden, but for Christ, that's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so now when I see things that I could take responsibility for that weren't my fault to fix things, I jump on those because those don't come up every day. Well, and I think that's what I was driving at. I, you had to make your point again for me to remember it. And that is, I think that's that's a great feeling for me. It And I don't, as a Christian, I don't like to talk about feelings too much. There's nothing wrong about feelings. We have feelings as, as humans. But too much of Christianity, I think, is about how we feel. But I think that's where I was going with it. And that is... I can begin to turn things around. I can jump in the driver's seat and I can steer us in the right direction. You know what? It's going to be a bumpy ride, but I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to hang on. It's time for a U-turn. You don't keep talking to the bus driver about, hey, you're, I think you're going the wrong direction. And he's like, no, I'm not. You, you jump in the driver's seat, yeah, keep things I mean, from going over the cliff. And the, the beautiful thing is you've got your own bus. Why do you have to keep following him? Yeah. Yeah. Or get off the bus, you know, like, <laughs> you know, you jump out the back and jump out the window, you know, get out the emergency exit. But the little bit of land I own, I like to think, yeah, you know what? I planted a flagpole and hey, this land, this, you know, third of an acre that God has allowed me to steward to him. I'm going to take it, you know, and my children live here and guess what? They're going to be part of this. You know, we're going to, we're going to take dominion of this little part of the earth. It's a very small percentage, but we're going to do it. You know, that speaks to, to how you are going to take dominion over something and you're going to be religious. The Supreme court, you know, I mock them where they'll talk about this, secular versus religious dichotomy, and there's no such thing. I used this word secular earlier, but I, I tend not to use that word, but I use the mm -hmm. word humanist or man-centered. And, or, you know, if we're going to talk in overt Christian terms, that you're either a covenant keeper or you're a covenant breaker. And now if you're, if you're a covenant breaker, you don't want to hear the term covenant breaker because those aren't the terms you're going to start off with. But you're, that does not make you a covenant keeper. You're still a covenant breaker. And everyone's taking dominion. You know, that's why I think economics is always a big part of life. And because we we can take our money and advance the gospel with it. Um, I know I know to a lot of people that con you know tying money in with advancing the gospel is unpalatable. I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel, but I'm talking about utilizing our wealth to advance the gospel and to take Dominion. If anything, I could buy, you know, Bill Gates has recently been buying up a ton of land, especially in the South. I, I think it, some people speculate it's because he sees with food, you know, big food is big agriculture is becoming an issue. And he sees that as a way to invest. But the more land you own, the more you can privately exclude people from it. And you can you can plant your flag in that big amount of land and you can advance the gospel. And people are always going to try and take that away from you by passing laws or whatever it is. But nevertheless, you have more power and more authority with land and with property. Um, but anyway, it's I do I do see so many positive things in our country. 
I, I know things, you know, people have a tendency to talk about what's bad and what's negative on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think if I look locally and I see the things happening and how I can affect things to a greater degree locally and with the people around me, I think that over time that has a huge impact on the gospel. Whereas if I just look at certain websites every night and think about national politics, I'm going to go to bed having done nothing or thought nothing productive or even goal setting in my mind for the next day about how mm. I can advance the gospel. And so you had asked me earlier about kind of what my day looks like and, and what I think about. And that's just it. I like to think of the news as uh, all of the all of the job openings that need somebody to fill them. So if you just keep <laughs> browsing through job openings, but you never actually apply, what's the point? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to kind of wrap this up. Uh, tell us about anything that you're involved with. Where could people go to follow you or keep up with you? Yeah, I appreciate that. So Deconstructing the Coliseum is the organization that we do our work through. And this, the first part of this year, we've been in kind of a fundraising transition stage where the organization is now officially a nonprofit. Right now, homeschool conventions, we will be at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention in June, where there are national leaders that will be there, which we have affected, you know, your listeners would probably have heard of. There is also a book that I authored. I think I published it in 2016 called Abolition, Overcoming the Christian Establishment and Education. And the listeners can go to amazon.com and purchase that. If they type in Abolition, uh, Kevin R. Novak, they can find the book and do a review on it. The book, I think, is like maybe eight, nine bucks. Really what we need with Christian education is implementation. We're in the implementation phase of Christian education. Well, in, in before that, I should, you know, you mentioned earlier about repentance and then implementation. So we need people to read what's there and look at what's there. And they get hundreds and hundreds of different videos and short radio broadcasts. They're called DTC briefs on deconstructingthecoliseum.com. So people can pr consume all that media and learn about the different angles and facets of Christian education. But thereafter, they really need to repent and then go out and begin implementation. So the ministry, that's what, part of the reason why I don't produce a lot of media right now is because we really don't need it. Besides that, personally, I'm involved with the Christian Education Initiative, or CEI, Christ, uh, I think the website is christedu.org. And there are many other organizations that are part of that, some good reform thinkers. The big ministry that's involved with that, or two big ministries that are involved with that, that the listeners may have heard of, Exodus Mandate with Reverend E. Ray Moore. He's basically our field general, and he's been around. He was part of the production of the documentary Indoctrination. And then the Foundation for American Christian Excellence or Education, FACE, is, is a big leader. So they're doing some really good work on the East Coast in Virginia on Christian education. So, but listeners can can look at Christ, uh, the Christian Education Initiative, ChristEDU.org, and see how they can get involved because that is the tip of the spear. What we did a couple of years ago is at one of our at one of the DTC education forums, we got together as leaders. We literally just got together. It wasn't a smoke-filled room. But it was a, you know, it was a hot, warm uh, room that we got in. And we said, look, how can we get together and be more powerful as leaders instead of operating as individual organizations? How can we caucus together and be more forceful and powerful and get that power curve to where we need it to be? And, and that's what came out of it. Thankfully, it was very productive and still operating right now as an organization. And then, of course, listening to this, this is a great platform, a great podcast where people can listen and then just share it to other not like-minded people. Share this with people that do not think the way that you think. Well, thank you so much for your time, Kevin. And this was a great discussion. I hope to do it again sometime soon. Okay, great. Thanks, Adam. T-H-E-E. O-C-R-A-T at gmail.com.